Native Land Pod is a production of iHeartRadio in partnership with Reasoned Choice Media. Welcome, 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 welcome. Welcome home to the native. Landing on the podcast space, that's for greatness. 60 minutes is so hit, not too long for the grave shift. High level combo politics in a way that you can taste it. Then digest it. Politics touches you, even if you don't touch it, so get invested. Cross the T's and dot the I's. Gill them back to get them. Stand on business with Rye. You could have been anywhere, but you chose us. Native Land Podcast, the brand that you can trust. Yes. Welcome home, y'all. This is episode 21, y'all. We are legal. Legal. Oh, well, we I are. guess we're legal at 18, but we legal, legal. 21 of Native Land Pot, where we give it to you directly, straight, as my good friend Tiffany says, no chaser. You're going to get it here on politics, culture, and everything we think is important to talk about. We are your hosts, Tiffany Cross, Angela Rye, and Andrew Gillum. What's up, y'all? Hey, ladies. What's up, Welcome y'all? Home, Welcome home, y'all. Welcome I'm home. I'm drinking to uh, We're 21 today. We are. Uh, I got mine. Shout it's out kombucha. To, it's kombucha. Cheers. To, shout out to RJ for the r- red mug. Take Can a we shot take a of shot? Kombucha. Cheers this to is lavender love. Cheers. Well, they ain't paid for advertisements. They don't show them. Well, mine is just but some it's pineapple a soda. Business. It's small. And I'm not going to name check who it's from, but okay. I found it in my Wild hood. tonic. Okay. <laughs> but the listen, y'all, we, we, yeah. we, we, we had our first live show Woo! last week. Rah, rah. It was so much fun. It was so good. It was so good. On today's episode, y'all, the jury is out. As of time of recording, the jury has been uh, admonished by the judge to get to the deliberating. We're also going to go inside the Democratic Party establishment. We're going to talk about panic setting in, spreading throughout many high-level Democratic officials who are, to put it lightly, a little bit nervous about November Uh, We're going to talk about what these poll numbers mean at this point. Then we'll jump into the Middle East and talk about what's happening in Gaza. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has vowed to continue the Israeli assault on the city of Rafah, despite, despite repeated um, admonishments uh, from countries uh, stretching worldwide, and also despite horrific bombing of citizens, Uh, designated safe zones and increasing condemnation, as we said, from the global community. We'll hear what the administration has to say about that. And we want to talk to you directly, our audience, uh, about a question, comment, observation that's been coming our way in our chats and conversations and just the general mood of what we've been feeling. And that is, how do you decide who to vote for when both presidential candidates, I don't know, kind of seem, yeah. Uh, Maybe a better and fairer way to put that is maybe you've decided that your life won't be changed by either way of the outcome. And we want to talk to you about how we talk to each other, our family, our friends and loved ones around this upcoming presidential race. We'll give our best input thoughts and you'll hear us think out loud around how it is we're approaching this upcoming November election. Stay tuned. It's going to be a great show, everybody. So, y'all, we want to begin today's conversation uh, with uh, a quick update on what's happening in the Trump trials. And I almost, Tiffany and Angela, hesitate to say trials because we've only seen one. And I'm actually not convinced we're going to see many more. Um, Certainly, there won't be another one before Election Day. Uh, Many of us have been uh, tuned into the coverage and the Chiron reading by various hosts on television or or in various newspapers. And um, we've reached the culmination point. In fact, um, uh, Tiffany and Angela, I was telling someone before the show began how, I don't know, tense I felt. Um, Not just sort of I've been on the side of, of, of sort of jury being out, you know, thinking about my own fate. Um, um, but this seems to me to be so much more consequential. Uh, 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 this jury, what it may come back with. I don't want to have us, you know, percolate necessarily on what do we think the jury will decide. But my question for the two of you and really for our audience is, have we really given thought to 
what happens um, politically as a political uh, outflow from any decision made by this jury. And I think what we mean by any is in the range of possibilities, there can be an acquittal outright. Obviously, there can be a hung jury um, and there can be convictions uh, at various levels of the charges that have been brought against uh, Donald Trump. Now, I got I can imagine that if you're Trump, you're going to skewer this, you know, skewer the system no matter what the outcome. I don't know how Biden plans to respond. And I'm not as concerned about that. I'm mostly concerned around whether or not you think there will be a lasting consequence of the verdict as we think about this race in November, um, if, if, if Trump's let off, if he has a conviction, do y'all think it matters toward November? Mm. Okay. Tiff is looking quiet probably because she doesn't I, well, like I to talk was, about Donald Trump. No, that's not true. I was letting you speak first because my answer oh. is on something else. I, I would rather y'all weigh in and then I'll weigh in. Okay. So, um, you know, I think, um, this is really fascinating to me. Um, one, because there are so many indictments at play here. This is a 34, if you remember, Alvin Bragg wrote out 34 indictments yeah. um, against the former president um, last April. And this is now what the jury has to consider. Um, the thing that's been frustrating for me in some ways is I'm someone who, um, I'm not an auditory learner. Um, mm. I am an eye gates and um, an eye gates kind of learner. So I wanted to see this trial, which we couldn't really see. Yeah. Um, I think the other thing that I'll say is I was telling you all um, earlier on our, our pre-pro call that I really think that the prosecution did an, um, an interesting thing before the jury went out for deliberations in reenacting the call between Michael Cohen, um, then Donald Trump's security guard, and uh, Donald Trump himself to demonstrate how long a minute and 36 seconds is. Right. Um, I don't know if that creativity um, gets them where they need to be um, in this 34 um, these 34 counts. I don't know. I, yeah. I haven't paid close enough attention to the trial, but here's what I do know. Yeah. I do know that uh, Donald Trump has a rabid base. I do know that um, there are folks who want to believe that he is someone who has taken on the justice system and the system is out to get him, especially because he's painted this lie um, so well. And his folks believe that, you know, they had to stop the steal, even if it meant yeah. wiping shit on Nancy Pelosi's desk. Pardon my French, but that is indeed what happened. Um, and so yeah. I think that the only thing that can happen from this trial is that his base grows increasingly more rabid. I think that if he is found not guilty, they're going to think that he's the people's tr champ and Rocky on the steps in Philadelphia. Right. If if mm. he's found guilty, they're going to, you know, be rabid again about why this system took him on and why it's so patently unfair. Um you know, and then the last thing that I'll say is I think it's very interesting, too, that one of the arguments from the defense has been, hey, this is someone who wasn't trying to sway an election or what the voters knew. He was merely doing this to keep it from his family. Right. And if we take Donald Trump out of the equation, that's actually a very compelling argument. Um, I don't ever <laughs> want to give his team credit for much, but I think out of all the lawyers he's been through, he done been through, he done ran through some lawyers. <laughs> that was a compelling piece for me. And so um, we'll see even, what the jury's... Even if he's never seen with his family or wife? I mean, like... like Listen, these people don't care. They they think Melania fly and, you know, he got kids from all his baby mamas and he trying to keep it from all them because they don't want them to be more upset. Who knows? But I'm just telling you, when you love somebody and when you're a fan of someone and you are, like I said, yeah, rabid for the eighth time, yeah. you don't figure it out. And so that's yeah. the real question. What about the rest of the folks on the fringe? Can they also write it off? Will they also write it off? Or were the facts, will the facts sway them in this case? I don't know. Well, I, I think that they discredited it because Melania has been so absent. I mean, you saw Tweedledee yeah. and Tweedledum show up, you know, with their, their like, we are the most loyal to their father. For the, for the people um, who, are, who are they? Didn't they who are bring they? Tiffany out of the... Uh, <laughs> I, don't think Tiffany, I don't think Tiffany. It was Laura Trump, uh, Don oh. Jr., and Eric. That's who I saw. Oh, if you I saw can, something okay. different, maybe you well, saw something different. Which one was Tweedledee and which one Tweedledum? Um, Tweedledee is Don Jr. Tweedledum is Eric Trump. Everybody knows that. 
Oh, sorry. I okay. Used, I, yeah, I used to say, and I'm not advocating violence, but I used to say they were so punchable. They used to oh tweet at me when I was running for. I was like, man, these guys are so punchable. I, you know, I you mean, I don't think it's violence oh. when it's a universal belief. Catch but anyway, like from Miami, this is this is baby. my my bigger point because I I've not been caught up in the minutia of the trial either. I kind of you know I'm one of for when it comes to um, things Donald Trump because I always say it's like catching confetti trying to keep up with it. Um, mm. I am more of a headline reader just to give and you know. Like, like, oh, OK, I see what's what's happening from a macro perspective, not a micro perspective. I think the the bigger challenge here with me is as Donald Trump has um, been on this trial, his base has not gotten smaller. Um, yeah. There were not people yeah. to walk away from him um, as completely predicted. Nimrata has now said she will vote for Donald Trump. If you were surprised by any of this, you have not been paying attention. Y'all called it out. I think it Both is a continuation of the erosion in the judicial system system. No matter what side of the divide um, you occupy, you, we have lost faith in the judiciary. The, I, it's not lost on me that this is happening at the same time um, as the news come out has come out around Sam um, Samuel Alito, Justice Samuel Alito, mm. and his wife uh, apparently looked at Jenny Thomas and said, hold my beer, let me get into this. <laughs> Um, and it just, it makes me look at no matter what happens, whatever this outcome is with this trial, yeah. um, the, the, it's like the, the belief in our functions are, are, are the cornerstones of our democracy are yeah. eroding over time. This is yeah. the first time something like this has happened. Now, remember, um, you know, I try to say like, here's something that was happening 30 years ago or a hundred years ago to show that history is cyclical. Nothing's new under the sun. So this, the same thing did happen with with um, Richard Nixon, you know, when his trial was mm -hmm. out, it was one thing that was being televised. And now it just seems to me, Angela and Andrew, that we have normalized this maniac and his yeah. myriad of trials and tribulations that he has brought to the American people. And it hasn't had any impact. Like yeah. it just, it, it has it's done nothing to his polling, nothing. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, I, I've said this to you guys privately, but I'll say it publicly because I, I feel like there are so many other people who may feel this way. I'm getting increasingly exhausted. And it is personally outrageous that so many people out there would ha rather have a dumb white person run this yeah. country instead of a smart black person because racism runs that deep. And two, um, that there are over 75 million people who are willing to overlook everything disgusting about yeah. this man because they have been brainwashed. So I, I don't know what's going to happen in this trial. Uh, well, brainwashed brain or, or – no, 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 Tiffany, I was just going to you know, push you on that, which is brainwashed or have they decided from day zero that w the uniting factor between all of them – has to do with their their need, their desire, their desperation to hold on to power. When you make this, when you make the deal with the devil, right? You take all the bad that comes with it because what made you bedfellows, what put you in this together is this common, unassailable mission to, in this case, in my opinion, keep hold on to at any cost power in the wake of a changing demographic, a changing American electorate, you know, um, um, power but I say potentially shifting Andrew, from because it's not it's not all white people, you know. Like when we were in Miami, I'll tell you power guys, didn't, yeah, uh, yeah. There was a lot of at the airport. There were so many MAGA hats, MAGA T-shirts, and you. I remember um, in uh, Washington D.C. This was maybe four years ago, and somebody was walking down U Street, which is a historically yeah. black neighborhood, with a MAGA hat and a MAGA t-shirt on. And I legit was concerned for this man's well-being. So I'm like, you right. got some balls to walk around. And people were definitely looking, but kind of, you know, skipping past him. He wasn't comfortable. Not so in Florida. Like right. there, I well, also there are a lot of fuck mega um, t-shirt. I would have been uncomfortable. I would have worn it, but I would have been uncomfortable. I would have been in the minority in Florida, and these are Latino people who overwhelmingly yeah. in Miami. I saw Latino people, so to me, it is brainwashed if you are willing to I vote for someone who is openly saying things about your community and you personally. I mean, he Here's, gave Lindsey Graham's cell phone number to everybody, and Lindsey Graham said, "But I love you." He yeah, dragged yeah. Uh, Nikki Haley across all kind of stages. He said, "But I'm voting for you." So, yeah. I, I to me, that's brainwashed. 
And, Tiff, and you got the last, I mean, Angela, you got the last comment on this. Yeah, I think to this point, um, we're starting to see some changes, even in something called the polls this early. So on that mm. point, I think we, it's a great point moment to switch gears and see what's happened with these battlegrounds and why Democrats is it, Democrats. Jesus. Democrats? Oh. Come Democrats. On. Well, Democrats. If you're, talking, if you're talking about the party <laughs> and the changing demographics, you say Democrats. Oh, I was with thank you. Thank you, Tip, for that oh. save. Way to go. Ah, yes. Dem- Democrats. Let me tell you this i don't think democrats were included in these polls talk to us about it andrew (laughs) as always keeping us on track so the latest polling uh some of y'all may may be seeing articles and your local papers those of us who read read national papers but it's everywhere y'all the folks are getting nervous and obviously i think it's a function of the fact that hell we're now past memorial day and we're closer to the election day um, but from the Hill, um, 712 uh, polls, Trump across battleground states, leading Biden 46 and a half to Biden's 45 and a half. Biden's overall approval rating this month tied for the lowest rating in the history of his presidency, y'all. Biden's approval rate is 40.7%. Around this time in his campaign um, and presidential term in May of 2012, Obama's approval rating uh, sat at around 47 percent. So the polling that we just referenced are obviously of of some of the key battleground states and some of the national uh, polls of registered voters. And in some cases, um, actually, in fewer cases, uh, if you look at the cross tabs, less likely voters. Um, which I think is 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 interesting, um, and we can talk about it obviously on the other side of, of of this piece. But there is a difference between registered and likely. Um, there is also interesting. I don't know if y'all found this interesting or not from the political article, Politico. I'm sorry, article that many of the top Democrats who gave comments uh, on this, who reflected on what some of their personal experiences are with donors and and other sort of um, um, experts in the field, is that they didn't want to be named. They don't want to be associated. Uh, publicly with some of the trepidations that are happening uh, that are happening behind the scenes. Now, I'm not dumb enough to think that we have the monopoly on the right answer, but I am curious to hear y'all's perspective on at this stage in the game. And I referenced Obama's previous numbers just by way of comparison. Do we have something to be ringing the alarm bell about? And if so, is there anything Biden can say, do or calls to come into formation that will change where people, frankly, are right now as it relates to he and his administration. I, I got to say, every single time I hear a conversation about polls, every time I see one on uh, outlets, every time I see an article, I immediately go, <sighs> me, 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 because it just <laughs> is such an inside. I mean, I, it, it's I just boring saw enough to make me sleep. It's such an inside the beltway conversation and the beltway media is so incestuous that they every outlet you call the hill political all of these people they talk to each other for each other about each other and I think if we want to disrupt that that we have to stop putting so much emphasis there number one a week so is do you an think eternity. it's wrong do you think it's not uh, on point do you think yeah th- I do they're not I mean personally placed? I just I don't I think campaigns can pour over polls I don't understand the point in forcing it down um, the throats of voters in the American people. But again, this is how the, the Beltway media has penetrated this in, in so many um, ways, I think. Uh, what does it matter to a person living in Pennsylvania who is, you know, they feel a certain way, they have their issues that they're voting on. What does it matter to them at this point? We have a nominee. We have a Democratic nominee. We have a Republican nominee. What does it matter how they're doing in the polls? To, to me, so that's something Tiff, for campaigns I, to worry about. I have, I'll just what, to push you on this just, a little bit. Okay. Because uh, I have a, uh, the, I have a point I want to make, but go ahead, ask me the question because well, I want to make sure. I, I, my question is, whether you agree with polling, don't agree with polling, put put sauce in it, don't. At some point, we got to have indications around whether or not this administration is moving on the right track, the wrong track, what we're facing, so on and so forth. So I'm curious to you, regardless of 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 the instrument, do you believe that there's cause for alarm? 
I mean, okay. So again, I, I I will go back to the original point I was making. I think campaigns have to worry about that. I don't think that the American people have to consume that. I think that's something hmm. for consultants and the the politicians themselves to worry about. I think for voters, what's more interesting and what's more to the point is this is where this candidate stands on this issue, and this is what this candidate is doing about this issue, and this is what's happening around these issues that impact us all. Number one, like I said, a week is an eternity in politics. So when you what happens is they just put out, ooh, Biden is doing bad in the polls or ooh, Biden is up two points or ooh, Trump is up two points with this group. And no, like most people just do not have the curiosity about it enough to say, well, when was this poll taken? Who did they poll? What's the margin of error? How did they poll? Was this an online poll? Was this a, a poll where they were calling people cell phones? Well, what kind of person's answering a cell phone number that they don't recognize? What were the questions asked? What was happening in the news? cycle when this thing happened. It does nothing to inform people. It does nothing to further the conversation. It is the same to me echo chamber BS that we see all the time. And I just I don't think we should be talking about um, polling all the time. I mean, I know I understand it's well, something I, that happens. I, mean, I, I haven't talked think, about it. I think no, we probably spent more time dissecting this to you. I'm polling thinking, definitions. No. Okay. Well, the point I'm anything. making is about media at large. It just doesn't inform people. So... Those are my thoughts on polling. So, uh, Angela, I'd be curious. I don't know if, if I. Uh, so, if we move the conversation from one of the instrument of polling and rather one of what we are either lived experience experiencing from the people we're talking to in contact with, is it a admission? Is it appropriate to say there ought to be alarm bells going off around the country everywhere that not. Biden's campaign is in a terrible place, but that the democracy we think we might inherit post-November might be radically different because of what the outcome the, of, of the election may be. If, 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 if I'll admit, not bury the lead, I'm worried, but if, we're, if this is not cause for <laughs> concern, um, tell us why we shouldn't be concerned around where Biden stands right now with the American electorate. Um. <clears throat> Well, I think there's I think two things can be true. I think the first thing um, that I will acknowledge on on Tiff's part and that I will probably take a step further. Again, y'all know I was raised by an activist, so I come here with full conspiracy theories and proud of it. (laughs) I believe that polling has more to do with sounding alarms to um, get the typical white consultants on both sides of the aisle and everybody in between more contracts. Like, this is why you need to spend more dollars <laughs> right, with us yeah. so we can send out more mailers. This mm. is why you need to spend more money on these ad buys because mm-hmm. look at your numbers. This is why you need to go after these Nikki Haley voters that are never coming to you because they are more valuable than everybody else. Like, I think it has more to do with sounding that alarm. Mm. That said, I do think that the information is worth dissecting. Um, in part because I think that um, if we're honest, the uh, to Tiff's point again, the news cycle does dictate how we feel about a candidate on the local, state, or federal level at any given moment. I really disagree with what this person did this week. And so, therefore, I don't really know how I feel about them. I'm not fooling with them. You might say that. I have never been polled. I don't know if y'all have ever been polled. I have never, never. in my life been polled. So, I also feel like, it's my other conspiracy theory. <laughs> That sometimes these people be making this stuff up. I don't even know if they're really talking to human beings. I'm not talking about Terrence or, or, or Cornell, but I am uh. talking about some of these other ones. I just don't know if they really actually end up talking to people. And you know, I didn't lost my other point. Oh, the last point Andrew <laughs> was should no matter whether we're considering polls or not. Um, is there is there a reason for alarm right now? Absolutely, and I know we're going to talk about it more in this show particularly given what's happening in Gaza, particularly given what's happening um, with aid to foreign aid to Ukraine and to and to Israel and what is happening here. There is reason to feel alarm. Um, I feel alarm personally because I'm as you guys know, like we have been pushing for this pardon for Marilyn Mosby. And I'm irritated that we haven't even heard really anything concrete from this administration. We have the right to push the administration on causes that we care deeply about. And when you're not responsive to those causes, yes, it pisses me off. Yes, I'm frustrated. And so there, I don't want to collapse these really large scale macro level issues into something small 
but that small thing is very meaningful to us in a major way. And so, yes, there's a reason There's reason for alarm in a gazillion ways. Um, but yes, I know we're going to talk about it more later. Yeah, yeah and I so have a question I, about that later in the show, Angela. Um, so audience, stay tuned, because before we get off air, I want you to explain why a pardon is still needed for Marilyn, even yeah. though she's not um, serving in jail time. A lot of people have asked me about that. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I have questions about it, too. But getting yeah. back to the um, subject of, of polling, I do think that is um, like an interesting transition to talk about Gaza, because, again, while it does not inform voters well, I think that this administration would be idiotic to not consider how their myopic yeah. staunch stance on Israel has not had a direct impact on how on the enthusiasm levels um, of how people feel about uh, voting this November, which is yeah. frightening. Yeah. So d- to uh, polls be damned, um, <laughs> I think the... Well, we should get a, we should get a pollster on because I know people are going to be mad at me no. for what I said, but I'm not trying I to would like to name sense. the podcast no, Polls I, Be Damned. Polls Be Damned. I, I, I or think, Smoking Polls. And I and, and of all people who ha, uh, should should have issue with polling, I, I I've been on both sides of those things, yes, and I've seen where they come from. But I will say this: if where people stand and how they feel um, about a particular issue was derived from what they see on the news, then everybody's hair would be on fire all about the, the Trump trials right now, except that it is hardly registering as it relates to the impact on where he stands with the American electric. I think that's an interesting paradox. Yeah. Um, I also think it's interesting that, um, um, in, in, in my opinion, the, how do you say, the polling around where the American people prioritize what's happening internationally um, ranks far lower than almost any other issue on the planet. Uh, Israel, Gaza comes up only in relationship to where American resources should be being spent otherwise, not in overwhelming outrage about what's happening on the ground. And yes, we're going to go to that topic, but I just the, the reason why I think I'll offer my take here that the polling does matter in the context of what happens, not just toward the election's outcome, but also towards what steps the administration takes, how hard they go in the paint, for instance, on one side of this conflict uh, over another, whether or not they talk about WIC in a public statement or rather they put it in a byline of a press release is, in my opinion and in my experience, having run and also served, it is largely driven by the fact that if people aren't talking about it, don't appear concerned about it. And most uh, inputs that give a politician um, their cues on that is from polling Um is because they have learned from the American people that it's not important and therefore they don't talk about it. I have found with almost nearly every politician I've ever worked with, many of them don't necessarily drive news cycles with courageous positions on things. They drive news cycles in reaction to what they think people want to hear or what they think people are most interested in seeing them do. Um, And so I don't want, at least from my perspective, I don't want anyone to think that these things are insignificant, don't matter, only uh, uh, matter with a consultant class. They matter for all of us because they almost always dictate the actions of the people who are in power, who are making decisions, who are passing laws, who are proposing laws. Uh, It it has a direct impact on whether or not Mm. they do something or they don't do something. That's not by and large everybody. But I I. I would not look to the political class to be the courageous class. They are almost always the followers of what people on the ground are already doing. But can I say, Andrew, I feel like you're agreeing with my point. Like it matters to the politicians. (laughs) Not I don't. voters. Like if I, I don't. The, if I, I the think it matters always, to the voters. I think it matters to the yeah, voters because it dictates the actions of the politician, I, which is what I affects agree. my life. I agree. But I'm yes. So you're right. It matters to the voters in terms of like, yes, voters should be polled and that info should be shared with politicians. All those things matter. But to lead a newscast or to like make this the headline of like, oh, everybody, here's what the polls say. I would go back to Angela's point. I think that is about consultants. And especially when most times you're not even explaining like some people don't even know, like this polling outlet is heavily conservative. They skew to the Mm -hmm. right or the way questions. 
questions are even framed. The right. question c- could be like, if you can say, well, how do you feel about the Biden administration's handling of Gaza? That's one thing. Or the question could be, how angry are you about Biden? On a scale of one to 10, how angry are you about that? That has a completely different um, sen- sentiment sure. to it when the question is asked. Also, as a politician, you know how focus groups are. When you have a focus group room yeah. full of white people, send a white questioner in there to ask them how they feel about something. For sure. When it's For somebody sure. different. So you get different responses. And the same thing happens on the I know I can tell when I'm talking to somebody who looks like me and when they don't. And it's a different response. So I think you don't want to say it, but I think you are agreeing with me on some level. I, I, I would say it if I agree. I'm simply <laughs> saying the reason why it, it can't be thrown in the trash is because of the power that these instruments have I don't think toward they should be thrown dictating. In the trash. What, uh, whichever, waylaid. Uh, I like not this, important. and I'm not even in it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, the reason why that can't, that, the reason why that cannot happen, and I hope people don't allow it to happen, is because of the effect that it ultimately uh, ultimately has on the body politic, and on who gets seen, who gets heard, and who gets the benefit of the actions of politicians because of how they've shown up in these numbers. Um, um, and, and we don't even get polled. We, cover we don't even get poll. We going hard and we don't even get polled. Y'all never That's- been polled. Precisely. I, 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 and I, you're saying, Andrew, the way that polls are presented and covered now, you think the status quo is fine. Like the way this works, it works no, for you. But my, but my issue isn't on the coverage. <laughs> the coverage of it. Oh. My, 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 my issue with it is... If we summarily dismiss it as being unimportant and only important to a certain class Mm -hmm. of person, then we suspend with what is the most, I think, impactful part of this, which is it dictates then actions that people in power take. Then there's a balance. There's a balance to strike then. But if we don't ever get polled. Then guess who's impacting the decisions that then get made? We had a problem with the way in which. Uh, post this, this is so too, uh, talked about WIC. We had an issue on the show, so live to in a person. state of you the went, union. You went through and talked to one of your friends from Capitol Hill to find out where to find a particular piece yeah. of an important element of the budget to the audience, uh, to some of the people who listen to, 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 to the show. Mm-hmm. That, that was because, in my opinion, they are not going to put out press releases. They're not going to put out major statements on pieces that they don't want to get a lot of attention. Tiffany, you say this all the time. They whisper what they're mm-hmm. going to do to us, and then they shout from a microphone what they're going to do for others. And I would say the reason why that happens is because they've been given indicators through instruments like polls that say people aren't interested in that. that they're interested in this. Po- you, can we do it? Okay, I, wanna not, like to have, I, I, I would I would like to have, you. I would like to have a Native <laughs> Land Pod poll. If you're listening, everyone, please <laughs> yes, can, tune honestly, in. Can we seriously and create let a us poll? know? I'm trying to, Tiff, but you but interrupted that my matter. PSA. Oh, uh, but but Angela, we need a document to go with it, don't you think? Like, I want to put out a for real poll where people like L- Lolo loves Nick. She Google interrupted Docs. my PSA. Okay, go do your PSA, but All I right. want like a for real poll. <laughs> but let okay. let, let Angela PSA. do I know her y'all PSA. Moving us a little. No, well, I don't think PSA. it would take this much time. Everyone, I really didn't. Okay, if my hearing. It's your fault, Andrew. Anyway, here we go. So, everyone, if you're listening. Please tune in. We would like to hear from you, not just with video questions, but this time there's going to be another survey. It's not Nick's survey. Uh, This time we're going to have Lolo create a a Google Doc. I don't know what's going to be on it, but we want to poll you because you know what? You never get polled. But here you will not be Invisible Man Ralph Ellison. Here you are seen. Welcome home, everyone. Andrew, take it away. I love that. I love that. I love love that. We're going to do a Native Land poll. On to a much more serious note, and that is um, May 24th, the International Court of Justice ordered Israel to halt military operations in Rafah and keep the area open as a safe zone. Despite this order, Israel military uh, launched attacks on a refugee encampment in Rafah, killing nearly 45 people and injuring dozens more. On Tuesday, May 28th, Israel launched another attack in Al Mawasi, another safe zone, killing 21 people. As of May 21st, 35,562 Palestinians and 1,478 
Israelis have been killed in the war. But sometimes words don't do the significant horror of what's happening there, Justice. So let's take a look at some of the reporting from the ground. Uh, the clip that we just saw was um, after the IDF struck uh, an encampment in northwest Rafa. And what you saw visually is people um, covering bodies, bodies burning, um, people in like desperate pleas um, for help trying to administer aid. And yet another air quotes mistake um, Mm -hmm. that the government of Israel has called it. And they've made a lot of quote unquote mistakes, I have to say, um, that I think we're looking at close to 40,000 civilians killed at this point. Um, Although people on the ground will tell you that number is significantly higher because there are bodies still, uh, according to some reporting, buried beneath rubble um, and bodies and people who are to this day unaccounted for. Thank you for the, yeah. that, uh, Tiffany. On May 21st, President Biden made these remarks. We reject the ICC's application for arrest warrants against Israeli leaders. Whatever these warrants may imply, there is no equivalence between Israel and Hamas. And it's clear Israel wants to all, do all it can to ensure civilian protection. But let me be clear. Contrary to allegations against Israel made by the International Court of Justice, what's happening is not genocide. We reject that. We will always stand with Israel and, and the threats against its security. So those are the marks of President Biden that predates what we just played, the clip we just played of the attack in northwest Rafa. However, I think it's important to note that those remarks were still after many similar events where the IDF had struck civilian camps and killed numerous civilian people in Gaza. So next, we're going to hear from John Kirby. John Kirby is the uh, spokesperson, press um, person for the Department of State. And this is uh, a sound from John Kirby. So how does this not violate the red line that the president laid out? As I said, we don't want to see a major ground operation. We haven't seen that at this point. How many more charred corpses does he have to see before the president considers a change in policy? We don't want to see a single more innocent life taken. And I kind of take a little offense at the question. No civilian casualties is the right number of civilian casualties. Tiff, uh, you were right. John Kirby previously um, uh, was the communications voice at the Department of a State. Now he is the National Security Agency's Forgive spokesperson, me. which means Thank he's you. right there in the yeah, White House. Okay. Even more important, though, to your yeah. point, he's in the belly of the administration's operations. It's thinking and what it wants to communicate to the world about where the president stands on 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 important issues of, of national security. This um, is just so. I, I just wonder how how this all sits with y'all, and 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 I get a sense of how it sits with with people, but I'm curious how it sits with you. I'm sick. I like I I literally I cannot. Um, I I just I can't make sense of this. To me, when you say. Um, that this doesn't, Israel hasn't crossed the red line because it doesn't, it, it's not considered a major ground operation. I'm curious to know what a major ground operation is. Is that a hundred people? Is it a thousand people? Is it 10,000? It is, a, is it a hundred thousand? What constitutes a major ground operation when you are fighting people with cannons that have slingshots. I just, Mm. I don't understand what it takes and how we got here. And I think what I'm more repulsed by is my own, um, 
not apathy, but my it's, it feels like there's a callus that's developing mm. over my heart. Like it's mm. it, it's it, it's becoming the norm, and I'm not saying enough, and I'm not doing enough, and I don't know where to start, and I feel. You know, like I'm I'm so inspired by so many of these young people, but I'm still so frustrated that all of what they've sacrificed has not fallen on deaf ears, but it hasn't risen to the level that has required this administration to really change much. And I just want to know what it will take, what you know, what will cause you to lay you know, campaign donations aside Mm -hmm. and lay your 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 commitment to the Iron Dome aside and really just move towards peace. You you know, I just I am struggling with this. I think about what Dr. King was saying about the Vietnam War and like how we get to the point where we will literally put a hierarchy on lives, you Mm -hmm. know, whether I'm not saying that people in Israel should be held hostage, but I also damn sure don't think that these kids deserve to be blown to shreds. Like this is just beyond. And I really don't understand how a nation that prides itself on Christian values, (laughs) when they see this type of um, genocide, because that is exactly what it is. It is it is the willful killing of a people who come from a certain group who are made up of certain DNA. That is absolutely what it, what a genocide is. When you see this genocide, how do you square that with your Christian values? Where is your compassion? Where is loving your neighbor as yourself? Is it loving your neighbor as yourself depending on how much they can donate? Is it loving your neighbor as yourself depending on if they're a part of a promised land that you have somehow warped the Bible into talking about? Like I just... I'm sick. I, so I think um, it's a highlight of how tone deaf this administration is, even for John Kirby to be offended uh, at the question. Um, you, you know, it highlights such a disconnect with voters. And uh, Angela's 100 percent right. Well, we are witnessing genocide. Now, I do want to point out that Israel and Rafa in Gaza is not the only place where this type of That's devastating right. conflict is happening. And a lot of people ask, why don't you talk about this? Why don't you talk about that? We are very aware. Obviously, we know what's happening in Haiti. Obviously, I'm super well read on what's happening in the Democratic Republic of Congo. I'm very well aware of the conflicts happening in Nigeria, all throughout the continent, Sudan, clearly aware why this is so important and why this matters uh, greatly. Not that the other conflicts don't matter, but why the U.S. has a keen interest here is because we're talking about nuclear powers. Israel is a nuclear power. And so I think uh, President Biden is trying to tread lightly. I think it is as much about, um, you know, the votes as as it is about global diplomacy and the shift that we see happening among superpowers, because there are some strange bedfellows making new friends on this stage. And I think mm-hmm. Netanyahu is such a Zionist. He is so laser focused on eradicating the Palestinian people um, from this territory that he is willing to make friends with anybody. So if he loses this big brother of the United States, where might he turn? What other nuclear powers might he turn to um, to get to gain funding? Um, and to continue in this, I think, heartless, inhumane um, effort that we've seen. I think another interesting thing that has happened in the United States, which I greatly applaud, it used to be taboo. You could not say anything. People would conflate Jewish people, the IDF, and the Israeli government and make them one. And you cannot do that anymore. You cannot cancel people. You simply do not have the control to do that. There are Jewish people among the protesters. So you cannot say everyone who disagrees with the actions of the Israeli government when it comes to murdering civilians, women, and children, that you're anti-Semitic. Not true. I rebuke that wholeheartedly. Obviously, we don't support anti-Semitism. We're seeing something completely different. And then when you see people speaking out about it, and people showing you what you don't see this is the American media, but social media has democratized who has a voice. And so we see numerous videos of uh, you cannot t- tell don't tell me, don't believe my lion eyes and lion ears because we're seeing it with our own eyes. We have seen decapitated children. We have seen charred bodies. We have seen lifeless. We've saw a grandmother get shot to death while trying to take her grandchild to safety. And so I, I think as long as this administration has been willfully ignorant to the cries of the people on the ground who are their voters and this 
these cries have extended across the globe at this point. The entire world is looking at Netanyahu and the atrocities that the IDF has committed on behalf of Netanyahu with utter disgust. And who is funding that? The United States. There is the other side, Andrew, where you have to consider, well, I'm so mad I'm not going to vote for Biden. What do you think is going to happen under a a second term Donald Trump presidency? So I Mm. fully understand people's frustration, but apathy or a protest vote and all those things, I don't think you will get the intended outcome with, 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 with making that move. Yeah, you know, I appreciate but my, but the the heartfelt and brilliant nature of both y'all's comments. And uh, Angela, in her uh, conversation, basically defined what genocide is, but just definitionally, and it doesn't vary really much from what she said, is the deliberate killing of a large number of people from a particular nation or ethnic group with the aim of destroying the nation or group. I mean, it, and, and quite frankly, it's exactly what d- jihad is when when. Uh, certain Islamic leaders uh, who are um, anti a Muslim state say they ought to commit uh, jihad against Islam. It is, I mean, against um, against Israelis. It is to wipe it out as a as as a group. Um, and the reason I believe it requires serious interrogation by the United States government, the 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 veracity of these of these charges is because the Netanyahu government appears to be increasingly packed with racist bigots who and I'm not making this up this is this is this has been reported in yeah. in in uh in Jewish sources both in Israel as well as here in the United States and all across the globe and if and and, and if the US government was full of that we could truly identify as as full of racist, persecuting racist policies with the goal of extinguishing black people in this country, we would call it what it is or any group of people in this country. So I, I, I don't, it's so serious that this isn't a, this isn't a matter of name calling. We're trying to get to the crux of what is going on and Biden as the president of the United States and considerably considered by many uh, nations in the world as a moral leader, if not the principal then moral leader in, among democracies, um, can't seriously reckon with this while at the same time saying Israel has a right to defend itself. I, I, I don't I don't I don't know where that leaves us. And the, mm-hmm. and the horrible part that I feel about this, y'all, is that. It will be in somebody's memoirs long after they have served and had an ability to impact what's happening today that we learn about regret and a decision that should have been made that wasn't. Um, 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 And and, and the the truth of that matter is, is it ain't worth the paper it's printed on after you leave a position where you can do something and to a place where all you can do is opine on your mistakes. Tiffany, you you broached where we want to go, I think, next. And we've heard this and in many ways are are pushed there by our listeners themselves who have some interesting queries around how we reconcile the totality of the Biden agenda, what we're experiencing and seeing today with how they are supposed to perform, how they're supposed to show up and if they are supposed to show up. But we'll pay some bills and meet you on the other side. Hi, Native Land Podcast. My name is Brenda Guha, and I'm a South Asian artist here in um, New York City. So I'm trying to think about um, ways to convince um, my friends who vow not to vote for Biden, um, how to convince them that that's a mistake. Um, I hate and am so disappointed by everything Biden is choosing to do in terms of foreign relations, in terms of his um, weird loyalty to Israel because God damn, if children dying doesn't change your mind, I don't, I don't know what will. But <clears throat> that being said, Trump is worse. And so I'm trying to figure out how to talk to people about it without dismissing the consciousness and their spirit. Um, and I think it's being handled in a really irresponsible way when people ask the same question because they're like, you know, shaming people for not liking Biden right now. And it's like, <laughs> can you blame people, you know? but. There's still a strategic choice here and I need language. And I was hoping y'all could help me with that. Thanks. And she wasn't alone. Let's hear from another listener. What's good, NLP? My name is Luke Isaac. I'm a 25 year old from Memphis, Tennessee. And I wanted to ask y'all this. 
as far as Biden, where is his core base? Or where's the voters that are in his back pocket? Because the people I'm around are either older black and brown people that are tired of the amount of money that is getting sent to Ukraine, whether it's right or wrong, they don't feel like there's an equal amount of money flowing through our community to lift us up. And then it's younger people that are around my age, college students that are fed up with the amount of money going to Israel. These are things that will stop people from voting for you all together. And I, it's like that administration doesn't seem to get that. So I want to ask you all, who is the core fan base? Because I don't know any real Biden fans right now. And I'm kind of getting worried because it's looking like Trump is going to be on some unconstitutional mass deportation stuff. And I can't support that either. So I'll be honest with y'all, I'm leaning towards team couch. And I know y'all hate to hear that. I'm so sorry to say it, but that's... That's where I'm at. These were two really thoughtful, I thought, and considerate mm -hmm. comments slash questions. And it really gets us to a theme that we've been hearing, I think, rather repeatedly, which is this whole idea of, a, of the lesser of two evils when you consider Biden v. Trump. And um, the, the question around who is Biden's people, who are his base, who is coming with him, I thought was a real interesting and I thought rather informed analysis that you hear from some older folks. Look, we sending too much money to Ukraine and this and why should we be concerned? And you hear obviously across college campuses and many communities, you know, just being fed up fed up to the point of protest. And, 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 and the truth is, is the movement against the Vietnam War started somewhere. Right. And 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 it'd be interesting to see where this goes. But the lesser of two evils, how do we help listeners think through how they're to talk about this with with friends and family? I, I guess the first thing I say is honestly, um, and that can be painful. What do you all think? Well, I think these are, those are two very different questions, because I think the last guy was asking, who is Biden's base? And I think all three of us can say in unison, Biden's base looks like us. And that's something that, unfortunately, this administration seems to be remind need to be reminded of a lot, uh, which is pretty frustrating. Um, Biden's base is not the Nikki Haley voter that they seem hell bent on going after. To the first young lady's uh, uh, question around what do we say to people? Look, I have to say we as as black and brown folks in this country, we have never had the privilege of being single issue voters. We just cannot afford that. Yes, I want to add. Do y'all think that there has ever been a candidate that stood with me on every single thing I believe in. And if they didn't, I had the privilege to say, oh, well, no, oh, well, I'm just going to go vote for somebody else or I'm not going to vote. We just don't have that privilege. But I say that understanding that there are many people, particularly people of Palest uh, who are Palestinian um, in this country, it would be really hard for you to ask me to vote for somebody who is killing or funding the killing of my people. So I, I don't want to dismiss that frustration from people. I, and I, the truth is, I have no words. I have no words for somebody who is saying, you're killing my family. You're killing people who look like me. I, I, I don't I don't have any encouragement there. For a lot of other people, I understand that you want to stand in solidarity and that we all in unison crying, screaming from the mountaintops, this is genocide. We don't don't like it. However, this this policy will not change under Donald Trump. If you think Donald Trump is going to stop funding Israel, you are wrong. He has said publicly, uh, he has pledged his support publicly to Netanyahu and to um, the Israel state and has supported um, what he's seen happen in Israel. So I, I to me, it's it's pretty simple. I would also advise um, the young woman to focus on policies that the Biden administration has administered and has gotten passed um, through Congress that has benefited people uh, of color because there have been many policies that we benefit from that it might not be apparent and it might not be as tangible um, in your life tomorrow. But but for sure, there has been policies that this administration has um, instituted that we we benefit from. You know, I um. I think that these are related um, in part because what I think that I hear our folks wrestling with a lot is not feeling um, the support uh, from an administration that we know that we help to not just elect but prop up. And so when you can see the billions of dollars going in foreign aid, not just because of what Joe Biden is doing, but because of what the Republican-led House and the Democratic-led, barely, but Senate is doing, um, 
it's hard to not it's hard to not feel invisible in that. And it's hard to get people motivated when you're like, okay, where do I really align with you on the issues? And frankly, I think what is really tough is in the middle of having this conversation right after Rafa, you really have to think about um, if the achievements that they've touted, especially during the, you know, the Black History Month fact sheet are commensurate with what they're asking us to do or what, what they asked us to do in 2020, which was to risk our lives in a pandemic to go out and vote. Has this administration been radical or um, courageous enough to garner that same support. And I think that they still got some work to do. I don't think it's over. I think that there's still a possibility. But I will tell you, after seeing what we witnessed today and what we've been witnessing over the last several days, it's really tough. And I don't want to make it seem to our listeners like we don't um, carefully think, calculate, debate analyze every aspect of this every time we sit down you know like I don't think that um it would be honest for me to say uh I've never thought about who the hell else could run like that really has been my 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 thought like why are why how do we get stuck here this election feels like to me y'all are gonna laugh because I wasn't even registered yet but when I was in the third grade Michael Dukakis was running <laughs> George H.W. Bush and I went to vote with my parents every election. And I remember that year we had like a faux election in the third grade. And that was the one time I went to the polls with my parents. And I was like, I really am not excited about this. I was like, what happened to Jesse Jackson? Like, where did he go? And I feel that in the same way now, it's like, this is not what I signed up for. When I think about how elated I was to champion Kamala Harris being the vice president on this ticket, this is not what I expected. Um, I would like to hear so much more from her. I would. I know that she is challenging this president to do something different. I want to see that challenge. I don't think that um, when you are um, in partnership, whether it's in a marriage, it's at your church home, it's on a board of a corporation, it's, you know, nonprofit leaders. I don't care where you are. It is OK to disagree. And I think sometimes that is what makes partnership stronger. I want to see that. I feel like I'm all over the place. But my point is, I am not happy right now. And that is my truth. And I know that in some ways there are folks who are going to watch this and feel like I'm being remarkably irresponsible to me at this point. I feel like what would be remarkably irresponsible is to pretend like this isn't a very challenging calculation to make right now. This is hard. It's not easy. And I still know where my vote is going in the fall. It is with the Biden-Harris ticket unless there's some crazy thing that happens, happens at the convention and somebody else becomes on, is on the ticket. But I am not voting for Donald Trump. Remember, he's still the guy that was in charge of the Muslim ban and put Jared Kushner over Israeli relations. So there's that. That's real. Um, you know, I agree, given the clips from Rafa and what we talked about just in this episode, um, I don't want to dismiss anybody and their hesitance, resistance toward voting for an administration where on an issue in particular you feel heart wrenched about and 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 just utterly destroyed inside and folks don't have to look like you in order for you to have that emotional reaction to just senseless and aimless killing but i approach voting like i do anything i would do strategically um, you know, it used to be said that you plan your work and you work your plan with a protest vote, with choosing to sit on the couch. Those we our lives don't afford us the emotional reaction of I'm just going to sit it out and let what happened happens because what happened happens will happen to you. And to your family and the people you care about and the neighborhood you live in and the folks who you grew up with, your mother, your father, your siblings, your children, there are higher stakes here. And I'm just so glad that we didn't have protesters in the mid 19 in the late 1950s and early 60s who said we didn't get our way politically or otherwise. And so we're going to sit home. No, when they decided they were going to sit home, it was strategic. They sat home to extract something from the system 
that under normal conditions, the system wasn't rendering to them. And they didn't do that at the ballot box. They did that when it came to sitting outside of the bus or walking next to the bus and not on it until we could extract what we needed from that system. That was strategic. That was thoughtful. And it yielded over time the response that we know we needed, we require. When you go to a job and you're depending on that job for a wage to take home, to take care of yourself and your family, just because you had a bad day and a bad experience, by and large, most of us just don't quit that day. If we even think about quitting, we start to lay a plan. We started to talk to some people and figure out where else I can go. And when you go in to lay that Trump uh, Trump card down, no pun intended, I'm out of here. I quit. You got another plan in place to take care of yourself and your family. It's strategic. It's thoughtful. It's it's planning your work and working your plan. And so. No, there is not some heart, you know, um, heartfelt story that I can offer to say compromise on your value on this issue so that you can win temperamentally on this one. But unfortunately, politics and the science of it and the way elections work, certainly in this country, is it's usually a dichotomy. One of the two people is going to win. And when you size them up, if one is on a whole nother planet universe bad, That ought to make it up for you right then and there. So we may not be able to go to our families this time and say hope and change and things are going to be radically, you know, different, you know, as a result of this. But guess what? Joe Biden doesn't cause my blood pressure to rise. He does. You know, the excitement isn't, you know, there. But I tell you, I don't have I I have not always been excited about the choices I've had to make. I've had to make them anyway. And so in this case, I just think this is this is one of those places where. We're going to have to do what needs to be done because the situation makes it necessary. And in this case, the situation makes it necessary for me. I just have a quick question for y'all because I know we're way over. Um, If you put yourselves in the shoes of the Palestinian people, um, I'm thinking about Linda, I'm thinking about Rashida, um, who Mm. both still have family members there. Um, And it was our people. Mm. Um, killed, you know, to the tune yeah. of over forty thousand. Where would, where do you think you would land? Yeah, that that was the the point I just made. If they were killing people like me, I wouldn't be able to vote. So I understand completely. Um, you were represent uh, referencing Linda Sarsour, who's uh, an activist and Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib from um, Michigan, who was instituting the protest vote during the primary. And she's made comments like we're not going to forget this. And in November, it's hard for me. I could never ask somebody um, who is personally impacted. And these are, you know, community members and friends and family. It would be incredibly hard. I, I, I could not vote um, for this administration. I, I could not. And I understand that Trump is a much um, worse scenario. But if, if it's my family and my people, people who look like me, I don't think I'd be able to, which I don't know what that says about yeah. um, me or us or other people who feel that way, because I have empathy and I'm in solidarity with the Palestinian people who are being slaughtered. Um. I am not willing at this point to not vote for the Biden administration just because yeah. I am terribly fearful. It's not my people right now under a Trump administration. It was my people and it very well could be my people again. So that's why I, I'm voting for the mm-hmm. um, Biden-Harris ticket. I couldn't guilt anybody on that, Angela, given your setup. But I think we all have a role to play. And just like in relationships, some days we 50-50. Mm-hmm. And other days we 70-30. Yeah. And some days we 90 10. Yeah. And I guess what that means for the rest of us who aren't at the intersection of, of the impact in, the, in quite the same way as somebody who's got a family member, friend, relative who's being slaughtered right now. I think we have to lean in and maybe this requires your 90 10. Maybe you got to show up for that person who cannot in good conscience do it for themselves mm. because we know that the outcome could be not could would be worse. Angela, you referenced it. Trump's first attack in office was against Muslim countries. Yeah. What do you think he would do 
Carpet bomb. Of course. And do you think if, he'd have sour words for Netanyahu? I don't think so. so but, but, but that's not an argument that I think could be made necessarily to a person whose family sits at the intersection of saying. this crisis. It's like, how yeah. do you, how do you tell them why, about it if when right now is the present? And then what is our obligation right. then to these folks who were saying like, okay, well, I would move different if these were, I'm not saying everybody's saying that, but I kind of feel mm-hmm. like that too. I would move different if this was my people if I'm not moving different because it's not my people, then what is my obligation to mm-hmm. my friends who I'm allegedly standing in solidarity with? Do I push yeah. this administration harder? Have I done all I can to advocate for what is right? And I would tell you the answer is no. So what am I doing? If, I, if, I, if I'm saying ultimately in November, I know that we've, you know, this country slaughtered thousands of people who look like you, including your family members, but I need you to fall in line and don't get out of line in November and cast that ballot. What am I going to do to make it easier for them to cast that ballot? And I haven't done that. I haven't done that. I'm just saying I I have not done that. That is not okay. Like what would I, I, what would I need to, what would I need to hear to be okay with that? And I don't know what it is. I'm not trying to get people to sit at home. What I'm really trying to do because people get confused sometimes is stretch us our political engagement, our activism has to go beyond the ballot box. If it doesn't, fewer and fewer and fewer people will show up to the ballot box. Our obligation to our, our fellow citizens and these people who we love is to make sure that it is not just palatable for them. It's not just tolerable. It's not just they hold their nose and vote. It should be something that is that they do exuberantly. And right now they can't. Because their lives are literally on the line. They're not casting a vote for survival. They're casting a vote for a less less genocide? Come on, y'all. Like, we got, we owe them better than that. Like, what can yeah. we do to push this administration yeah. to say it's not, this is not sufficient. Your yeah. red line is f***ed up. Fix your red line. Move it. Because what you're doing, if, it were, if the shoe was on the other foot, if it was 30,000 people, Israelis, killed... There would be a World War Three starting right now. Yeah. Yeah. True. So what are we doing? Like we can't keep saying that there's no value on the lives lost and there's a, and, and then do something completely different. It's not OK. I just no. morally I'm not OK I with it. So I want to figure out what we can do to push this administration to do right by these folks, because right now it's wrong. It's wrong. Agreed. Uh, Angela, I just think we may talk about voting as the only layer of intervention and protection. But it's not. it's not. There's it's several. Not. It, guess what? There's a convention coming this summer. Shut, right. shut that bitch down. Yeah. Mm. You I get no are. business. You don't. How? how? Well, let's yeah, go like back to Chicago. Protests, you mean? Yes. Literally. And it will be in yeah. Chicago. They, yeah, they, yeah. they protest. Well, to what? your Hello, point. Hello, deja yeah. vu. Yeah. All yeah. I'm saying is there are a lot of ways to impact upon the process. I consider the option of not voting the nuclear option. And guess what? Sometimes there is in case of emergency break glass. And then there's that. But yeah. I can't also in good conscience knowing that elections have have consequences. Severe. It, it, advise anybody who cares about the plight of the Palestinian people and what's happening to sit on the couch. Yeah. That, I can't that, either. That, that, just, that, that yeah. doesn't work. There's a, there's doesn't a, work. The, the thing is, there, there keeps being, for those who are more politically astute, there keeps being this conversation about just sitting out the election, and that's irresponsible because there are four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten steps we can take before that. Come on. And I think that it would be really smart for us, and maybe it's another podcast because I know we're so far over, yeah. but it would be really smart for us to talk about what some of those options are. Is there a letter writing campaign to yeah. the Biden administration? Can you call on your members of Congress to sit down and have a real meeting? Have Biden come to the Hill and talk about what his strategy is and really give him what is the new red line what should the line be yeah. it should be not another live lost is that something that we should be helping to 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 orchestrate on this podcast well, the red this line is, to me is bs he said it was a red line if it was american crazy. lives well we saw what happened exactly with jose andres and yes. that wasn't a red line the red right. line is going to keep moving that's my point point. and so yeah. if the red line keeps moving then is it up to the voter to say no this is our red line you better not cross this red line and that is what I'm really asking maybe that is what we need to show because these again these kids they were willing to lay their graduation on the line and 
They're they're being it. it whether or not they're suspended from school. People it. are laying their jobs on the line. Folks are literally it. being ostracized because of taking these positions. But this is a human rights issue. And how dare we have another MLK holiday where we're quoting this man and act like this isn't everything that he stood for. And to your point, Andrew, Chicago is a great place. But there are a number of steps that could be taken in terms of sure. organizing people and bodies even before that point. But it's a great place. It's before November. We have a whole summer to figure this out, and we need to figure it out this summer. I really do, do believe that. I agree with you. I agree with you. I will just say Dr. King never, ever told anybody not to vote, right? And, 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 the, and the fight for our humanity and the fight for us to be seen as human, and, and, and I think the, the same fight can be attributed here, to see my life as valuable. Yeah. There were steps that were taken and much sacrifice, but never was it an option to sit out the election. In fact, I hope nobody hears me saying that. I was just saying, I hope nobody hears me saying that. I did not lay no, no, that no, no, out no, as an I'm option. Not, oh, okay. no, I'm not attributing that to oh, you, Angela. Oh, okay. That's not that. No, no, no. I'm not you. attributing that to you. I'm simply I like, saying. I hope I didn't in, say that. No, no. In saying. the myriad of things that can be done, I'm simply saying that if we, nothing, Tiffany, you said in this episode, nothing new is ever really new, right? It's been done before. And all I'm yeah. saying is let's reflect on the successful movements of our past as instruction, as guidance for what could be done to help move us along on this one. Progress yeah. can be had. I believe that. But but consider voting and not voting as a nuclear option, it is not a first place of resort for people who, frankly, are co-opting what is a tragic moment in history as an excuse to be lazy. Yeah. That ain't everybody. But I hear folks who don't show up for nothing out here talking about not voting and, 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 and attributing certain things as an excuse when it wasn't your plan to get out there anyway. Don't co-op this moment for some bull. Y'all, I know it deserves a lot more conversation. And I think um, I appreciate us all leaning in to try to participate in this one. And Angela, I accept your challenge in us thinking through what role we might be able to play, um, you know, going forward. Let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll talk about what our admonishments might be to the listeners. Y'all, it wouldn't be Native Land Pod if we didn't conclude today's episode as heavy as it may have been with our calls to action for what we could do right where we are to make a difference. Angela, you want to go first? Sure. I just want to um, first tell you all thank you, um, Tiff and Andrew, because it's been um, a really heavy, long few weeks. Um, y'all have dealt with me with <laughs> two or three hours of sleep and grouchiness. Nick, no, I was grouchy are... like our producer Nick that one time, <laughs> but every day. Um, and I just want to shout out our dear sister, uh, Marilyn Mosby, whose grandmother's in hospice care right now. Mm. Um, as you all know, the government spent millions of taxpayer dollars to give her uh, an ankle bracelet that's not from Tiffany's. Um, to have her on home confinement basically with a lot of um, latitude. Uh, but I believe that that is still not freedom. And when you haven't broken the law and you have been targeted, you probably shouldn't be confined in that way. So even though some folks are curious about why we're still pushing for Maryland's freedom, her like complete liberation and still pushing for a complete and full presidential pardon, this is the reason why she did not break the law. And despite how the government has tried to paint that uh, inaccuracy in press releases from the Department of Justice ad nauseum, um, and even in this trial, I hope you will still stand with us. We are closer to 100,000 um, signatures wow. on the petition. Um, shout out again to Tiff and Andrew for allowing us to hold that petition with Color of Change. But I would love for you all to continue to sign on, continue to call the White House and ask when that that pardon will happen again this is one of those things that this administration can do to demonstrate that it stands with um, black folks overall and folks who work to ensure that the justice system is far more balanced and maryland is certainly one of those champions for us so that is my ask go to justiceformarylandmosby.com today and sign that petition love that thank you angela tiff what you got um, in essence of time, because we're so over, I defer to Angela's call to action and whatever you about to give us, Andrew, I say follow whatever Andrew and Angela say this week. 
Double that's A. The, and let's let's put that in marble because Tiffany ain't never about to advise y'all to follow us. Yes, she <laughs> and does. What we say, Especially uh, from no, Maryland. No, of course. I'm jesting. Um, um, but but honestly, all praise and thanks to you, Angela, for the champion's work that you did in picking this and wrangling it. Um, uh, everybody needs a friend like you. And my Happy CTA, friends. y'all, actually change from what I thought when we started and where it ends is I would like y'all to help us think through offering suggestions around strategies that we might pursue to get an administration that we voted for to do what we want them to do short of pulling the nuclear option of not voting. So if you've got an idea, a suggestion, a thought, put it in our feed, our comments, do a video. What are the options you would consider before you would quit your job? What are the options you would consider before you would uh, uh, in significant ways shift your family um, in reaction to a thing, an action, something? Just give us your ideas for what we as a community could consider doing before we decide to sit an election out. Before we end the show, I want to remind everyone to leave us a review and subscribe to Native Land Pod. We're available on all platforms. Uh, and of course, YouTube, where you can see us. New episodes drop every Thursday. You can also follow us on social media. We are at Angela Rye, Tiffany Cross, and Andrew Gillum. And we just want to say welcome home, everybody. Welcome home. And there are 159 days until Election Day. Thank you for joining the natives. Intentional with the info on all of the latest. Rod Gillum and Cross connected to the statements that you leave on our socials. Thank you sincerely for the patience. Reason for your choice is clear. We're so grateful. We took the oath to execute roles. Yeah, faithful. Preserve, defend, and protect the truth. Even if painful. Welcome home to all of the natives. We thank you. Welcome home, y'all. What's Welcome up, home. sis? Native Land Pod is a production of iHeartRadio in partnership with Reason Choice Media. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.